The purpose of this video is to introduce a concept called effect modification and to describe how we can use stratifying to look for it. In the past, I know that students have had difficulty distinguishing between controlling for confounding and looking for effect modification. So before we get into it, I want to use a simile to hopefully give you a way to help distinguish them in your mind. Now, some of you might have used a power drill before, and this is my best rendition of a power drill. And we can use a power drill either to drive a screw into wood, or we can use it to drill a hole in wood. So the idea here is that one tool can do more than one thing. The same is true with stratification. We've already learned one thing that we can do with the tool of stratification, which is to control for confounding. And now we're going to learn another thing that we can do with a tool of stratification, which is to look for effect modification. I think the reason students mix up controlling for confounding and looking for effect modification is because they both use stratification. But they're different things that just use the same tool. Let's take a closer look. So we have seen this picture many times before. This is when we were controlling for smoking, when we were looking at the effect of coffee drinking on COPD. And in this example, we always found the same odds ratio inside the smokers and the non-smokers. And we said that when the odds ratio was the same or similar, that we could combine that into an adjusted odds ratio. So this would be the effect of coffee on COPD, or the association between coffee and COPD, adjusted for smoking. But there's nothing that says we would have to find the same association between coffee and COPD in both of these groups, the smokers and the non-smokers. They could be different. For example, if we were to increase the number of individuals in our example who have COPD in this group, it would look like this. And so here within the non-smokers, among those who drink coffee, the odds of COPD has now increased to 0.82. And so when we calculate the odds ratio in this group, it's 2.5. And so you can see that the association between coffee and COPD is of a greater magnitude among the non-smokers here than it is among the smokers. In fact, among the smokers, we didn't find any association between coffee and COPD at all. So the takeaway idea here is simply that when you stratify, the strength of the association that you find between your exposure and your disease variable might be different within the different subgroups of your population that you're looking at. So the subgroups that we were looking at in the previous example were the subgroup of smokers compared to the subgroup of non-smokers. Let's take a look at this idea of different magnitudes of effects of exposure on disease in different subgroups from a different angle. So you'll remember this view when we were talking about our definition of a cause. And again here, yellow circles indicate individuals who don't have the outcome, who don't have the disease, and red indicates those with the disease. And we're indicating exposure here by an orange box around the individual, like these over here, and those who are not exposed don't have any kind of orange box, like these over here. Now initially, we simplified the idea of a cause and thought of it as something which was either yes or no, either it was present or it wasn't. And we said that we would think about the entire population under a non-exposed condition and then under an exposed condition. And if we thought that the percentage of individuals who would have the disease would be different if everyone was exposed compared to if everyone was not exposed, that we could go ahead and hypothesize that our exposure was a cause of disease. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, except now we're thinking about a cause as something that is not simply a yes-no, but is something that has a magnitude. 
And so now it's not just that we want to know if there's a difference between these two conditions. We want to know how big the difference is. And beyond that, now we're adding the idea that the magnitude of that difference might be different among different subgroups within our population. For example, we might be interested to know, is the magnitude of the effective exposure on disease different among children and adults? And so we can think about that in this way by cutting the problem into half here among children and among adults and thinking about it in just the way we were thinking about it before. So now we're thinking about the children under two conditions, all of them exposed and all of them not exposed, and thinking about how big is the difference in the percentage or the odds who have the disease in these two conditions. And we can do the same thing down here with the adults. So you can see what we're doing here. We're stratifying the analysis by children and adults. So if we look at this in another way, it looks like what we were doing before with smoking. We have the children over here, and we have the adults, and we have some who are not exposed and some who are exposed on both sides among children and adults. And we can calculate the odds of the outcome in each of the groups, and we can calculate an odds ratio for the children, and we can calculate an odds ratio for the adults. And what we can see here in this example is that the association between exposure and disease among the children is 5.8, and that's much bigger than the association between exposure and disease among the adults, which is 1.9. When you have this kind of situation where the association between your exposure and your disease is very different within the levels of the variable on which you are stratifying, we call this effect modification. So this is the new term that we want to learn here. So here we have effect modification by age. Our variable is age. We've coded it as a binary variable, uh, adult or child. Those are the two levels of our variable. And so effect modification is called that because what we would say here is that age is modifying the effect of the exposure on the disease the magnitude of the association between exposure and disease is different among the children compared to the adults. That's effect modification by age. Now, it wouldn't have to be this way. We could have done this stratification by age, children and adults, and found that the effects were the same in children and adults. And if that were the case, then what we would say is that there was no effect modification here by age. The effect of exposure on disease or the association between exposure and disease is the same within every level of age. And so there's no effect modification by age. So this is actually quite simple. To check for effect modification, you first stratify the variable that will potentially modify the effect of exposure on disease, which we call an effect modifier. And then you check if the effect of exposure on disease differs within levels of the potential effect modifier. Now, the one thing you want to remember is that stratifying is a kind of conditioning. So if you're stratifying for whatever purpose, controlling for confounding or looking for effect modification, you need to think about whether or not the variable on which you're stratifying is going to open any backdoor path within your DAG. And so you just need to check this against your DAG before you start. And if you find that it opens some backdoor path, you need to probably block that path using another variable if possible but if not possible, you're not going to be able to stratify by that variable and check for effect modification. Now this probably very rarely happens, but it's something that you should always check. Another thing I will say is that you don't need to feel like the variable on which you're going to stratify in order to 
test for effect modification by that variable, you don't have to feel that that variable must fit into your DAG somewhere. It might not. It might not have any causal association with any of the variables in your DAG. So um, don't feel constrained by feeling like you have to make it fit inside. Now having said that, probably in many situations, you will think that it has some causal relationships with some of the variables that are already in your DAG. So you just need to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Now I just want to introduce by way of some examples the usefulness and versatility of the idea of effect modification for giving more texture to our hypotheses. And for this I'm going to use this view. And what this view represents, this is just the population about which you care. So, you know, using the NHANES data, probably we're interested in the non-institutionalized U.S. population. And so it just represents that there's a mixture of exposed and unexposed, those with the outcome, those without the outcome. And so I'm going to indicate this idea of cutting the population into subgroups by just drawing a box around the subgroup and removing them away a little bit. So this is just represents that we have cut our population into two parts to indicate two different subgroups of the population. And so what we're doing when we are looking for effect modification is essentially we're just asking is the magnitude of the effect of exposure on disease different within these two subgroups. So in the last example, we didn't use any actual variables when we were looking for effect modification by age. And here I'm actually calling it something different. I'm calling it effect modification by developmental stage because that's often why we want to look at children as a special subgroup of the population is because they're at a different developmental stage and because there are many biological processes that are associated with development that are happening with them exposures may have unique effects on their health that won't occur in adults. So for example, we might be interested in this kind of effect modification by developmental stage if we are looking at the effect of secondhand smoke exposure on airway constriction measured by FEV1 to FVC. Now another way we might use this idea of effect modification is to think that there might be differences in the effects of exposure depending upon the timing of your exposure. So for example, if you were interested in research on pregnant women and you wanted to know whether smoking by women while they were pregnant had an effect on their baby's birth weight, you might want to know if smoking early in pregnancy has a different effect than smoking late in pregnancy. And so you could subdivide the population into those who smoked early in pregnancy and those who smoked late in pregnancy, and you could test for effect modification by the timing of the exposure to maternal smoking. Now another way we might use effect modification is to look for genetic susceptibility to the effects of a particular exposure. So for example, with smoking, there's a gene which is called cytochrome P450-1A1. And this is a gene for an enzyme that's important in the metabolism of tobacco smoke. And so you might subdivide the population into groups based upon their genotype for that particular gene. And so you might find that the effects of smoking were larger in one genotype group compared to another genotype group. Still another way we might use effect modification is to think about whether our exposure may be more risky among some individuals who have a particular background level of other diseases. So for example, if we were interested in looking at whether having a high fat diet had a causal effect on the risk of coronary artery disease, one thing we might want to know is that if someone is already insulin resistant, is it going to be more risky for them to have a high fat diet than somebody who is not insulin resistant? 
And finally, another one we might be interested in is if the effects of exposure are different in women compared to men. And so here we're looking for effect modification by biological sex. Now there are many, many examples of ways that we might use effect modification to give our hypothesis a little bit more texture and depth. But my goal here is not to create an exhaustive list of them. I just want to impress upon you that this is a very useful and versatile tool in your data analysis toolkit. So for your model, I want you to choose an effect modifier so that we can learn how to use this important tool. So your effect modifier should have a few characteristics. One, I want you to choose a binary effect modifier to keep things simple. Now, of course, the effect modifier that you choose, you're going to need data for it in the NHANES data. And finally, because we're just learning how to use this tool, I don't want you to spend too much time, unless you really are motivated to do it, to think of a potential effect modifier. Now, if you can't think of an effect modifier for your analysis that makes sense based upon the reality of what you're modeling, then you can just choose biological sex and code it male-female um, to use that within your model to learn how to test for effect modification. So to remember from this video, first, stratification can be used to either control for confounding or to look for effect modification. And no matter which you are using stratification to do, when you stratify, you should confirm that it is okay to condition on the chosen variable by looking at its position in your DAG, if it has one at all, and to make sure that you're not opening a backdoor path by conditioning on that variable through stratification.